welcome to the Loan with Jen podcast, Real Facts, No BS. Today, we are talking about homeowners insurance, everything you need to know when you're wondering, how do I shop? What is this homeowners insurance and how, what, like, how does this all work? So today, we have an expert, Kathy Leger. Uh, she's a good friend. And Kathy, I just went through the process myself. And although I do That's this right. all the time... I was like, I still had a couple of questions and I was like, oh, maybe this is what my clients go through. Yeah, so, definitely. So tell us a little bit about you and your agency, just to let the audience know what you do. And Yes. Uh, first, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm always excited to do this kind of stuff. This is definitely the funner part of uh, what we do as insurance agents. I've been an agent for the better part of almost 20 years now. So I started when I was 12 you can see. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, at this point, I think I'm pretty good at it. I would like to think so. Um, you can all be good at one thing. And I guess this is my thing. I started first as a captive agent um, with an insurance company, which just means like, I'm a W-2. I work for this one company. This is the only company that we can write through really limited with what our options are. And um, and so and that was great. I spent about 10 years doing that. And uh, it was a wonderful experience. It really allowed me to get into management as well. I was running several locations, had um, upwards of 20 agents reporting to me at one time, and it was wonderful. But I definitely decided that we wanted to go um, a different route. I wanted to own the book of business, and I definitely saw the value in being an independent agent. And so that's where we are today. We're basically brokers, which means that um, we can write through any company that we choose to do. We have 30 or 40 different products that we're able to write so many on the home side. And it just really helps strengthen the relationship that we can have with our clients because we're not committed to the carrier. There aren't um, strategic uh, boundaries that we have to abide by. If we're not happy with the renewal offer that you get this year, we can very easily shop that rate for you again. And it just really helps us Um, stay up to date and relevant with the products that we offer that can really be tailored to the client. So that's where we are now, um, many, many years in business. And we've got, um, I've got two and a half additional um, agents that work with me that really help get it done. Awesome. Well, lots of good experience and managing a bunch of agents. That's got to be that's a bunch of experience right there. So yes, um, I'm going to dive in. Actually, my first question, you know, when people are shopping, it's really the same question they ask me, like, well, can't I go to the big bank? Or like, how do you as you know, I act similar to a broker, even though we're a direct lender, but same thing we can shop. So you mentioned the benefit to that is, yes, you can go directly to one of those big, you know, everyone knows it name. Mm-hmm. Um uh, carriers, but then you can also shop that same thing and just make sure that's the right, best coverage for them. Right. Right. And you'd be surprised to know that a lot of the, um, the, the bigger carriers, the ones who are buying all the commercial spots, I think is the best way to say that a lot of independent agents actually still can write through those carriers. So it really is a one-stop shop. Um, We have companies you've never heard of before, though in the insurance world, they're very well known, very difficult to get appointed with. They're very selective with the agents that they allow to write on their paper, um, as well as the commercial spot guys. Um, So if you want to be able to shop many uh, different carriers at one time, that's really what we're here for. It's a big time saver and it'll save a lot of heartache too. I mean, each each client that you have and each home that you're helping um, purchase, they're all different characteristics. And it's our job to make sure that we're fitting that client with the right carrier, that we're fitting that particular home with the right carrier that we know will give them the best rate. Uh, You don't want a brand new home with this carrier over here because they're not that competitive. But a brand new construction, I know exactly the two or three carriers we're going to go to. The rates are extremely competitive and the coverage is great. Same thing with the older home. There's a special fit for that uh, where hopefully they're not charged too much for that older home. So hopefully that kind of helps answer that question. Yeah, no, that does. So what I really wanted to dive into for people because most people listening to this are you know going to be buying a home or have a home 
Um, is it, is it true that you should maybe reshop your insurance every year just to make sure that you're getting the best deal? That's a really good question. So I would say if you, well, for sure on auto, and I know that's not what we're talking about auto, it's the same anywhere you go, just about, you know, the liability uninsured, it all means the same things. It's not very risky to shop it. And you can kind of just focus on the bottom line when it comes to auto insurance. Um, when it comes to home, you want to be careful with it. Um, if you have that relationship, you have the independent agent or a broker whose job is to make sure that when we are re-quoting these coverages for you, we have to make sure that the coverage is equal or better. If there's any differences in the one I'm quoting you this year than last year, I have to go in writing and explain that to you or it's on me. So if you have that set up, do it all day long. In fact, I always tell people as soon as we sign the first document, hey, you're gonna get your renewal in about 10 months and I need you to reach out to me at that time. Just send me a quick note, I got it is this the best that we can do? And that gives yeah. me 60 days to get you in line and start working through those requotes. But to answer your question, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just that there's a lot of, um, a lot of things we have to be careful with as we quote that home again. It really is not just about the bottom line. We have to make sure it's equal or better and really know those 85 pages. There's a lot of documents that are real specific about what they do and don't cover. So we have to know that. The problem when a consumer alone just starts quoting everybody and calling everyone they can think of is they're only looking at that quote sheet. And everybody knows that quote sheet is really limited. It's coverages A, B, C, D, E, deductibles, and premium. It doesn't tell you anything about what those 85 pages are hiding. Yeah, that's that's true. I've I've same thing in mortgage, right? Like it's, it's good to have someone who's an advocate who really is not tied to any one company that can, that can decipher all through all the noise for you. Um, my next question. So let's say, let's say you're a, a new, you're going to buy a new house. So you, you know, you're that I'm a homeowner and what are the things that I should most pay attention to? Like the blind spots in those 85 pages, if you can give us just like the top few, I know that there's a lot. In no, there. yeah, that's great. Um, and so when we're quoting somebody, when we send a quote out, there's about five or six bullet points that we're going to tell you about our quote. And that really, I hope is what people will take those five or six bullet points and say, oh, well, the other guy didn't mention that. Let me go back to the other guy and ask him about these five or six things. The first is that we want to make sure the carrier is A rated. And um, if you're working with a lender for closing, they're usually going to make sure of that for you. But if it's a cash purchase or maybe the underwriting guidelines are not as strict, they may not make sure of that for you. So we need to make sure that carrier is financially rated A or better for financial stability. How do you do that? Like, how do you where ask? Go on, but can yeah, I you want to make sure and check it out. Absolutely, you can pull up the carrier's information and you can search for their AM Best rating or their Demo Tech rating, and that so will let you know. People, so, because mm -hmm. you know, someone who's not an A rated, they might not come out and make it easy to tell you, right? So, like, if I googled, I would say, I would say Demo rating. Yeah, you can check the demo tech rating, which is for the smaller companies. They're not quite big enough to be under AM best. And then okay. the other one is the AM best rating. So I'd bet that website is something like ambest.com and you're checking for the financial strength of an insurance company. Okay. So that's going to be the first thing. The okay. second thing is going to be to make sure that the policy is an open peril. So to keep it super simple, there's two main types of homeowners insurance. There's a named peril and there's an open peril. And you would be surprised to know that most of the commercials that you see only offer the named peril. That's the more limited one. And so to make it simple, name peril names for you those 12 things that they are going to cover. OK, everything else that happens to your home is automatically declined because it wasn't specifically those 12 things. The open peril is the reverse. They're open to covering anything that happens to your home, no matter how crazy your story is. 
as long as it's not on the exclusions. So open is completely open. It's sometimes called a broad form. And those exclusions, you know, they're not trying to be funny there. The exclusions between the two types of policies are the same. The big exclusions to be aware of, flood, earthquake, wear and tear, and poor workmanship. Those are the four that we will see, uh, we always try to make sure to mention. Three of the four come up quite frequently. Earthquake, you know, not really our big deal. But earthquake is also defined as earth movement. So I just got a call yesterday. Kathy, I'm starting to see the cracking in my home, the settling in the corners. My doors are sticking. I have foundation coverage, right? That's that's a earth shifting issue, which is an exclusion. The and other so thing I usually, uh, sorry, I just have one question. Uh -huh. So on open peril, it's kind of things outside of what you just mentioned, flood, earthquake, Basically, outside of those four, you can call with any issue, no matter how crazy. Um, I saw one on Facebook, um, a real estate agent listed. She was selling a rural property and there was a huge lightning storm and a cow had stormed through the house while it was listed. Got oh my mud everywhere. <laughs> yeah, he was frightened. He got in mud everywhere. She posted the picture of this beautifully staged home with a dirty cow in the middle and oh. mud everywhere. And that seller had to have had an open peril policy in order for that to be covered or they're out all that money because a storm cow situation was clearly not on a named peril, right? That's the big stuff they named those 12 big things oh, on wow. an open peril. You can call with that crazy story. So maybe the cow doesn't happen as often, but you'd be shocked how limited those 12 things that they list are. And so it, it can be um, extremely costly not to have the right one. So I have one for you. Mm -hmm. I, in the house that we live now, um, five or six years ago, we have a in the wall fish tank that was built with the house. It's 500 gallons. It exploded Ooh, all yeah. over my house and they tried to get out of it. Trust <laughs> me, but I, I hired one of those guys that like yep. helps you and mm -hmm. it was worth the money. Um, but we did get some money from it. I must have had uh, an open peril policy otherwise, mm -hmm. but Definitely. I know they, they tried to get around it, but it was like, no, this is part of the house. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly a good point. It wasn't a pipes, right? Yeah, so no. if it was a named peril that would not have applied. So absolutely. You had the open peril in that situation, yeah. but it's, it's a no brainer. It's a straight decline stick into the contract. It wasn't okay. this 12 you're out. Okay. Awesome. So the <laughs> third thing, so one, we have check and see if they're a rated. Mm -hmm. uh, through demo tech rating or a invest rating open, uh, make sure it's an open peril policy. And then mm -hmm. even though those probably cost a little bit more, I would assume, but it depends. Hard. I mean, really when, when we compare a lot of our carriers to the commercial ones, um, we are extremely competitive. The coverage is better. The deductibles are better. The premium is better. It's win, win, win. So you'd be oh, surprised. Nice. Yeah. Uh, the okay, last the three, thing. Yep. Last three are actually going to be endorsements that really we need to look for. And as a buyer, even if you're an experienced buyer, this is your first house or your fifth house. A lot of people don't know to ask for these things. And there are some agents that will only write what you ask for. For every quote we do, we include foundation coverage. These are optional, extremely inexpensive, by the way. Uh, in addition to foundation, we do water backup. And then we do something called continuous seepage. Sometimes people just call it water damage. These three combined might be an extra 80 or $90 for the whole year, but oh, they wow. are real important. And if you don't see these three things listed, you do not have it. It's something that has to be added. And so foundation in short is just pipes, pipes, problems under the foundation or within the foundation. And somebody has to get there and fix it. And this is the cost for someone to get there and fix it. Either that plumber's gonna tunnel under your house, very expensive, or he's gonna tunnel down through your flooring, also very expensive. So that's what that foundation access covers. Oh, wow. Yep. Yeah. Water backup means water is going the wrong way out of the toilets, tubs, or sinks. We had one recently, she turned on, she has tw little baby twins, turned on the, sh the bathtub upstairs to start bathing the kiddos. Something happens, she takes everybody downstairs, maybe a phone call or a visitor, and water is just spewing out of the second floor floors many, many hours later. And so water backup is one of those that would have covered that. 
And then um, the last one is continuous seepage, sometimes called water damage. Very few companies will allow you to add this. And this just means that in addition to the sudden water, like the pipe bursting or the dishwasher exploding, this one will cover your leaks no matter how long they've been occurring. So we all know that sometimes things happen behind the walls, up in the attic, um, under the shower pans, you know, sometimes that's a nice slow drip and it's just not detected in that 14 day rule that everybody has. And so if you have water damage or continuous seepage, it's okay. It's okay that it took several months for you to tell that there was a leak. It's okay that you went out of town for the summer for a month and came back and the water was everywhere. Without this um, continuous seepage, that slow drip or that hidden leak is not going to be covered. And that, again, can be really costly because we're talking all the insulation before you found it. So those are the, um, the next three that I think are extremely important. And you just want to make sure that you have those options. Okay. I do have another question because I was recently, so I just recently closed on an investment property. You did the, the insurance help. for that. Um, but now I'm my primary one. I got that before I knew you, but mm -hmm. I'm now checking it out and like looking, really looking at it because my year is almost up. So I noticed just what you said, like I went, you know, I have AAA, so I directly went to them and mm -hmm. they were like, oh, well, we don't, we don't have live, like my liability right now is a million and they only go up to 500,000. So tell me about liability. Like when you're comparing apples to apples and let's say I have two insurance, let's say I'm a homeowner shopping and I have two, two quotes right beside me and they have different liability. Like why should I care? And what does that mean? To be honest with you, you shouldn't care too much about it. Although I know the big numbers on the paper, sometimes people think, oh, only 300,000, but I have 500,000 over here. Liability and medical payments are really not, um, well, the best way to say it is it's one of the most uncommon claims that you can have, but when you do have it, it can be pretty tragic. So I don't want to say it's unimportant, but to give you an idea to go from 300,000 to 500,000 might be 10 bucks for the year. So don't get sold on the one that had 300 or 500. Okay. Make sense? Yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. yeah, liability and medical are for the other people. They're for non-residents, people that don't live in your home. So it's not even for you. It's to protect you and your assets in the event that you're found liable for someone else's injuries on your property or maybe not on your property. You could be walking the Chihuahua two blocks down and the Chihuahua attacks some six-year-old. That okay. liability kind of follows you in the bubble. And now we're going to be okay. It's, it'll be a liability claim to take care of her injuries. Oh, but if you have one quote, that's 300 and you want it at 500, call it in, get it changed. It might be 10 bucks. The reason I tell you not to worry about it too much, anything over 300 is just kind of extra in my eyes because uh, there's something called umbrella insurance, and that's basically where you're adding millions on top of whatever you chose on the home, right? Yeah. That's extremely inexpensive. And the umbrella just has one rule. You got to keep your home at least at 300000 on liability, and then we'll give you an extra million. So yeah. <clears throat> pool owners, I really try to cover that base with them. We need to make sure we have a million somewhere. If the underlying carrier can't do it, we need to buy it. And that's just because we know it's quite easy for something really tragic to happen, either on your clock or not, but definitely in your property. And that's your problem. We want to take care of that. Yeah, we have an umbrella and you're right. I think it's like, actually, I think I have a, I have a big property, so mm -hmm. big property, big problems, right? But yeah, I think, big I, have, potential. I think I have 2 million umbrella and mm -hmm. it's like, 600 bucks a year, like really inexpensive, maybe, maybe 800, but yeah. yeah. And you're probably covering your autos too. So you can lump everything under that safety net of a million for really inexpensive. So don't okay. sweat the, the, don't sweat the other policy, whether it has 300 okay. or 500. So basically now I did want to address, um, and then we're going to go to flood insurance. So I know on the mortgage, we allow you to go up to a 5% deductible and that allows some clients who are like, Oh my gosh, I got to get my insurance down. I'm like, well, you could change the deductible. So talk about what's normal and what the deductible, what that means and the pro and con of making it higher. Let's say you went up to the 5%. 
Yeah, sure. So the deductible is basically what you agree to take on as your out-of-pocket expense when you have a claim. So the more you're willing to take on before you call the insurance company, the less they're going to charge you for your insurance. And it's funny, I was just, my son just started driving and I'm explaining this whole concept to him. And he's like, why don't they just pay it all? So the, if you, and our deductibles on homeowners are a percentage of the replacement cost of your home. Okay. So a $250,000 home with a 1% deductible, 2,500. If okay. you go and buy a half a million dollar home, now that 1% is 5,000. 750 and so on. So the bigger, um, the bigger home you're purchasing, in my opinion, the bigger deal, uh, your decision on whether you're purchasing a 1% or a 2%, you guys let them go to 5%. We've done that certainly. And definitely for closing restrictions, we've had to go real high up there sometimes. Yeah. I so- barely <laughs> ever had, I mean, I've had someone maybe go to 2%. They've never really gone to more than that. Usually. Yeah. If I remember, I'll tell you about some, a conversation I said yesterday, but the 1%, so used to be pretty common. We could get a 1% on everything. And that's really my preference. I would love to be able to get someone a 1% deductible on everything that can happen to their home. Unfortunately, as the homeowner's insurance market has changed over the last year or two, everybody's getting off the 1% wind and hail. It's just really risky. The hurricane seasons are becoming more active. It's real difficult to get a 1% wind hail hurricane. So if we can get it and the rate is competitive and it makes sense, we'll do it. Most people will have to go with a 2% wind hail. And that just means that on my $250,000 house, if I call in with a wind claim or a hail claim, I now have a $5,000 subtraction before they pay me for my claim, right? Mm -hmm. Everything else I get to stick with that 1%. So it's always a percentage off of the size of the home, the the reconstruction cost. And it's a one deductible per problem situation. So if you have a hurricane, yes, you had wind damage. Yes, you, some of your contents flew out of the house. Yes, you have loss of use. We need to put you somewhere while the home is being rebuilt. We're, We're pulling money out of all of these categories of the insurance but your deductible only applies one time. That's a common question I get. Yeah. People think at, well, with our carriers, with most carriers, that's true. I guess I can't speak for all. I've seen some, some different stuff. So yeah, sometimes people are like, oh man, you're going to subtract 2,500 from my building damage. And then you're going to subtract 2,500 from my contents. No, that's not how it works. And I've sometimes had the question, people think it works like health insurance. So they might have a claim in January their deductible was subtracted and then they got unlucky with the pipes freeze in February. And they're like, Oh no, Kathy, I already hit my deductible for the year. (laughs) And I'm like, I'm so sorry. It doesn't work that way. So those are kind of the two misconceptions I get a lot with deductible. It matters. You know, you're not married to it. I try to tell people that, especially as they are closing. Um, If we're having to do something to make those numbers favorable, or we need to go with that 5%, it can be changed. Um, Most will allow you to change it in your first 90 days. So if I tell people, if you just keep waking up at 2 a.m. stressing about that deductible, please call me. We'll get it fixed. And maybe we'll adjust one of the other numbers that aren't so stressful to you. Um, And same thing every year at renewals, which is why it's so important to open the packet. Please don't just open and look at the rate and close it. We want to open it up, make sure the company hasn't changed the deductible on you because they can do that too. You might open yours this year and it's going to, and you're going to look at the rate and you're like, Hey, that looks okay. It's about what I paid last year. Well, page two is where they explain, Hey Jen, we changed your 1% to a 3% because we don't like Houston anymore. And if you're not looking, you'll find out a bit too late. So deductibles, they are changeable. um, And, you know, we'll try to find the lowest for sure. Okay. So one more question and then I'm going to ask you about flood. Sorry. I already said that once, but I'm yeah, <laughs> no worries. I got another question. One more. Um, so let's say you're shopping for replacement cost, and let's say I'm buying the $500,000 house and one carrier, one, I call two agents or three or whatever. And one says, we're going to cover replacement cost up to 400. And the other one says replacement cost for us is 350. So like, let's say there's different, but, but they say that 
they have a clause that says whatever the replacement cost really is, we're going to, we're going to go to that anyway. Like if you, let's say my house burned down and it was three, you know, 425 to, to do it. So does it really matter when you're looking at replacement cost that one is lower than the other and whatever? Most definitely. So, um, small little note purchase price and replacement cost totally different so what you're buying it for and what it's appraising for and what the inspector said none of that really matters we're really looking at what the insurance company thinks is the cost to replace your home to rebuild just the house right we're not insuring the pool we're not insuring the dirt so none of that matters doesn't matter the school district how long it's been listed or anything else that you guys get to work with in terms of the real estate it does matter um, the number that you see there. And not everybody has that promise that you mentioned. So we call that promise guaranteed replacement cost. So there's something called 100% replacement cost. And then there's something called guaranteed replacement cost. And if you do not see the word guaranteed, it isn't. So what you see for coverage A on the dwelling, that's it unless you can see the words guaranteed replacement costs and guaranteed is typically several hundred dollars more. That carrier who only offers guaranteed, sometimes they give you the option to buy guarantee, but the ones who only offer guaranteed, it's built into that reconstruction cost that it's gonna be nice and fluffy. They're not gonna make that mistake, right? None of the insurance companies are in the business of giving you something you did not pay for. So it is your job as the buyer to make sure that that number looks realistic, have the agent explain it. When I first started 19 something years ago, the, the cost per square, per square footage was like 100, I mean, 110 maybe. So if I was buying a 2,500 square foot home, it was an easy calculation. It would be somewhere around 250,000. Well, of course, so much has changed in just in the last year or two and inflation and all these things we see. 135 per square foot is now what we see. And people are kind of getting shocked by that. You know, they're getting their renewal offers and we took the renewal from 250,000 reconstruction to 310. And they're like, what do you mean? And so they think that the it's just another way that insurance is trying to raise the rate. No, go call a builder. You know, our clients who work, get a little bit of construction done on the house first before they move in, they actually call back and say, Kathy, I only had three rooms done and it cost me 180,000. Are you sure we have enough for the whole house? Just based on what this guy has just charged me. So that's reconstruction. Really interesting because mm -hmm. I would think when, when someone tells me, no, it's a hundred percent replacement cost, I would miscellaneous, you know, me not knowing, right. Would think, oh, okay. Yeah. A hundred percent of whatever it is. If I have a loss, you'll pay a hundred percent what it is. But what you mean is if it says a hundred percent, don't be fooled. They're saying a hundred percent of what they put as the replacement cost. That's right. And by the way, built into these applications somewhere is a statement. Um, I think in most, you cannot underinsure. you can't lie. Okay, so we can't, if, if it's a 2,500 square foot home, if it's a home that's supposed to be insured for 350,000, and we're just trying to get the rate down, and we're just trying to get that more competitive, and we start dropping that number down, we can defluff things, maybe the kitchen isn't as nice as it calculated. Um, you and I, both parties are responsible for making sure that we are insuring the home to what we believe to be the true value. So. You can't just call in, even if you owned the home and don't, even if it's a cash purchase, you can't say, Kathy, I only want to insure it for 300,000. It's a cash purchase. If the house burns down, I won't even rebuild the one I just bought. I'll go smaller. I only want to go 300. There should not be an insurance company or an agent that's going to be able to do that for you because our job on that contract is to insure the house for what it is truly going to cost us. But that 100%, Jen, it gets even more confusing because yeah, you're, they agree to pay 100% up to what that coverage A says. That's it. That's your limit. You can add an endorsement. I do that a lot where we can get an extra 25% for a real small amount of money. That's not because I want to underinsure for 25%. It's because I know that when you are one of 20,000 homes in a category five looking for shingles, that roof is so much more expensive now. We all experience that with the freeze, right? 
plumbers and the cost was out of control because of supplies. People were driving to Louisiana and, and further states to get simple parts which drives up the cost. So that's why we'll add that endorsement on there. I'll tell you um, to increase that reconstruction cost by 50 grand or a hundred grand, it's not a lot. So I don't think we should skimp there. The other misleading thing is that just because it says hundred percent replacement cost, believe it or not, it's not true necessarily, particularly when it comes to the roof. Um, Built into those 85 pages are all these rules about your roof. And one of those rules centers around how old is that roof. So if there's one public service announcement I can make on this podcast, it is that the age of your roof, especially these days, is so important. Most will now have um, what's called a roof payment schedule. And it says, Jen, congratulations on your brand new roof. Next year, when it turns one, I'm going to take about 5% away from replacement cost. When it turns two, it'll be 15 or 10 or whatever. And it'll continue to depreciate the full coverage on that roof until it gets to, guess what, 12 years old. Most of these guys are saying at 12 years old, we're off it. It's depreciated value. It's not replacement cost. Oh, my God. You know, know what? 20 years old. <laughs> oh no, I don't want to quote it. I don't even want to look oh, at it. Oh my God. I, I, <laughs> I know, know I'm going to have to replace it soon. I'm just. Yes. I'll so ju- you paper. just want to, you just want to be aware of it. And, and in those whole 85 pages, Jen, it's one little paragraph in the whole thing. And how much does that roof cost you? It's a really important detail that, and I'm going to tell you one of the most popular commercials that we see every five minutes that company cuts off at 12 years old and you'd never know it from that commercial. Everybody feels so good about that guy and we love everything they say. And you'd have oh, no idea. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. That, that crazy, is huh? Spot, the roof. So do these, when, when I'm getting insurance, you know, when people are buying a home, I don't know if they get a copy of everything and like read every word. I doubt it. I mean, no. And it took me so long to even understand what those 85 pages were even saying. Even if you read it, you'd be asleep by page three and you wouldn't have understood page one and two anyway. So you have to ask. And it's so funny. And I tell people sometimes, first of all, I love when people ask me questions. I feel like it just keeps our brains alive. I love the new home buyers because they're really willing to listen. Um, And so when, when you need to ask the questions, it's now. Before you decide between agent A and B, you need to see the 85 pages, which you normally don't even get until oh after you purchase. Listen, just me, seasoned homeowner and seasoned mortgage person, I have learned so much in this, in this time that I, I can't wait to send this to all my current homeowner past clients to be like, look, Definitely. leaves are new. You got to... Okay, so last question. Uh I know we could talk for hours about this, but blood. Okay. So I'm going to give a quick synopsis up until now. So it's changed, but flood when you're not in a flood zone. And so we're in Houston floods a lot. Flood has been really right now. I, for what I'm paying, it's about 600, $681. I'm thinking I'm getting a good deal right now, but Mm -hmm. basically it's kind of a flat fee. It's cheap when you're not in a flood zone. It's, it's not that expensive. However, I just learned from you because we were quoting it on the investment property we bought. And I was like, Kathy, what are you doing? What what are you quoting me? Are you getting a tip? (laughs) Like I'm not in a flood zone. Why are you quoting me this high amount? So tell us what's changed for flood zone, when you're not in a flood zone, what is going on? It's actually everybody. And I hate to say it, but it's just one additional area that we as homeowners have as a huge expense for some of us that we really did not have before. Um, So back in October, FEMA decided that they were going to completely revamp the way in which they um, rate their flood insurance. And so it, it does make sense. They were going on very few things, one or two variables back in the day. Since 2004, when I became an agent, everybody's rate in zone X was the same. And so FEMA, obviously being underfunded for quite some time now, took a look at that and said, you know, is it really fair that Kathy, who lives in Houston, pretty much on the water, let's just say that, even though it's Katie. And then let's say Jen, who lives in Colorado, not surrounded by a body of water, also has zone X, they're both paying the same amount of money. 
Does that make sense? No, right? So Colorado shouldn't be paying the same amount, Kathy, who only has, what, 50 miles to the coastline. And so um, they decided to, instead of just one or two things that determine your flood rate, like is it X or is it not, it was now going to be a lot of things. How close are you to a body of water? What is that body of water? Is it a river? Is it a pond? Or is it the gulf? How big is your house, right? Because think about it. If Jen has her gorgeous million dollar house and Kathy has um, a little $150,000 house and we live right next to each other, which sometimes does happen here in Houston, right? Well, if we both get that one inch of water, that million dollar house is going to be a much more costly claim than the one inch of water in my house, simply because of materials, construction, it was a bigger span of one inch of water in the house. So it's going to be more costly. So the million dollar house is going to have to pay more for flood insurance than the smaller home, even though the max check is 250. Most people are like, yeah, but the most you're going to pay out is 250,000 anyway. Yeah, but we get there quicker on a bigger home. Make sense? So it yes. only takes an inch or two and we're going to be there. So um, what other variables? Prior claims. Before prior claims, uh, flood claims, would only determine if you get to stay with FEMA or if you have to go to a special place for too many claims. Well, now prior claims will determine your price. So if I didn't file for my half an inch of water and someone did, I still get a better rate now for the flood insurance. So anyway, this all happened in October. For renewing business, that all hit us in April. So if you had an existing policy, it was your renewal coming after April of this year that you're going to start to see the change. And honestly, Jen, I've seen X zones, so people not in a flood zone, upwards of $1,900, $2,500. I've seen oh a $3,000. Well, let me ask and, you this. I just got my flood renewal and my grandfather, because mine's only six eighty one. dollars No, they don't do that anymore. So it doesn't help you in any way to continue the coverage. I think there's a rule in there that they can only increase yours by a certain percentage, but you're going to get there. Now, if you're as we get closer to Houston downtown, that's where the rates are obviously getting higher and definitely Baytown and so on. But X only goes so far. So I have seen X upwards of 3000 and I'm telling people, no, you're not in a flood zone. So um, wow. just something to be aware of. Now that's yeah, through no, FEMA. I need to get the, I need to get the word out. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah that's through FEMA. Um, we also offer, we have now four different companies that offer private flood insurance. So it's just private carriers, not government funded. I personally think that's better as long as it's not surplus. Um, and they can often be really competitive. So in some of these cases where I'm coming up with a $2,500 FEMA quote, I've been able to also attach a $400 private flood quote for better coverage, better deductibles. And we've added certain things like pool clean out, which FEMA doesn't offer. We can offer um, loss of use. So we'll pay you to live elsewhere, which FEMA does not offer. So when we can, we're always going to back up that FEMA quote with a private flood quote just to see if you have any available options yeah nice no good to know well i we've been going for 45 minutes girl I oh, no. Been, no that's fine i've been just so engaged like i've heard so many good nuggets so i really appreciate it so listen if anyone wants to reach out with you what's what's the best way for them to to reach out if someone's in well you can yeah. do out of houston too can't you can't you yeah, absolutely. We can do the whole state of Texas. Absolutely. Okay. So we're happy to help. So uh, our website is um, actually, I think, on one of your signatures or something that you have as well. Uh, my agent at legerinsurance.com. And you and can Leger also call is... uh -huh, L E G E R. Okay. So my agent at legerinsurance.com. Yes, ma'am. Nice. Well, very good. Well, I listen, sure appreciate I, it. I could go on and on and on. Maybe I'll just oh, be back in I, a week or two. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I listen, I could keep asking you questions, but I think people's attention spans, they're probably already going to be they're ready to go out when they, well, they're already going to be overwhelmed after they watch this. So we're going to stop and we'll continue another time with some more questions, but I really appreciate it. Thanks for getting on. Thanks and, for having uh, me. It's been fun. Yeah. And thanks for helping me recently. I appreciate it. Definitely. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Sounds good. Thanks so much. Okay. You got it.